two minutes. So are, is it going to be the whole hour? Um, yes, it'll be an hour. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, so we'll try and start exactly at, uh, at 12. And Neil, as you know, has a very fast cadence of speech, and I can do that as well if need be. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, how are things? Good? Yeah, I feel like there's a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, yeah. You know, I got my vaccine, so I'm excited about that. And my parents hopefully will get over the next couple of months. I'll be able to go see them, which I'd really like to do. Have you had both shots or just your first shot? I had both shots. Oh, good. Okay, mm -hmm. well, there you are. You're okay. I think with, with one, I felt great as well. I think that, uh, you know. You didn't have any untoward effects from the vaccine? No, no, not at all. It just felt like any other vaccine to me. Um, one of our nurses, though, had an anaphylactic reaction with, with her shot. Oh, my God. Which was too bad, yeah. Okay, I think we're going to start. Welcome, uh, everybody, to Grand Rounds. Um, today, we're having uh, two presenters, uh, Dr. Jennifer Telford and Dr. Neil Shahidi, both from the Division of Gastroenterology. And uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, we're going to be listening to Colon Cancer Prevention uh, 2021 and beyond. So uh, Dr. Telford is going to lead off the discussion. So Jen, please. Take it away, thank you. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, Jennifer Talford is um, Barry mentioned. I'm one of the gastroenterologists here at St. Paul's. And um, uh, and then Neil Shahidi who's just joined our group in January. Um, who we're very excited to have come on board. He is finishing up his PhD and uh, did an advanced uh, fellowship in Sydney, Australia, um, looking at um, uh, advanced resection techniques for large polyps and um, you know, resections and, of early cancers in the esophagus and the stomach and the rectum. So um, he'll have some very exciting slides to show. I wanted to give an update on um, colon cancer screening, which will take up the first um, part of this. We haven't uh, spoken to you in a while in this regard, and um, I'm involved with the colon screening program, and so this is uh, definitely an area of passion of mine. Um, I don't have any... Um, conflicts of interest that would pertain at all to this to this talk. Um, so I'm going to review um, new evidence around uh, colorectal cancer screening and some publications that you may have seen, give a brief update on the colon screening program, and particularly focus on what we've been doing in terms of uh, quality assurance, which I know is a um, you know, really underpins uh, one of the strategic pillars here at Providence Health. And something that clinicians here are quite quite interested about in, in pardon. And then I'll turn it over to Neil, who's going to show you some great pictures and videos looking at advanced endoscopic resection of large polyps. So um, as you know, colon cancer is a very common cancer and the second leading ca cause of cancer death in British Columbia and throughout, cancer, uh, throughout Canada after lung cancer. And in BC, um, we have a 6% lifetime risk of developing colorectal cancer. And unfortunately, um, you know, uh, up to three, um, you know, a third to a half of patients can end up dying uh, from colorectal cancer, which, which is a shame because um, in its early stages, um, it has a very high cure rate when detected early, uh, which is the purpose of, of screening. And in 2016, the, the um, CADF um, had um, updated its recommendations regarding screening um, to include um, two tests um, recommending that adults over 50 get screened with a fecal occult blood test every two years or a flexible sequinoscopy every 10 years. Now, they've excluded a lot of other uh, testing strategies that are used um, in the United States and, and here in Canada as well, including colonoscopy uh, from this uh, list of acceptable tests that they recommended for screening. They had a very high threshold of evidence uh, for making their decision. So they only included tests that had randomized controlled trial um, evidence showing um, improvement in colorectal cancer mortality and incidence um, to inform their decisions regarding their recommendations. Interestingly, they, they did in the fecal occult blood test, they did include the fecal immunochemical test and that the FIT test, which is now the fecal test that's widely used throughout Canada for colon screening programs throughout the world really. 
Um, FIT didn't ha doesn't have any randomized control data showing uh, improvements in colorectal cancer incidence or mortality, but they felt comfortable extrapolating those older studies that were done on the GUIAC FOBT to FIT and, and, and therefore um, uh, asserted that FIT could also be used as a screening um, test. And they, they did say that if you have um, are able to do programmatic screening, be part of the colon screening program, as opposed to that opportunistic screening, um, that that would be um, preferred. And to date, all the provinces and one of the territories have commenced or announced screening programs, all using FIT with the exception of Manitoba, which is using a high sensitivity fecal occult blood test. So when um, evaluating a patient for colon screening, um, really trying to establish which, which patient needs to be screened, what test you're going to use, what interval you want to do it at, and what age to start and finish up. So in assessing risk, the high risk patients are really those that have a documented germline mutation um, predisposing them to colorectal cancer or uh, in the absence of a germline mutation because we aren't able to um, document that in 100% of patients who have a hereditary colon cancer risk. If they have the appropriate phenotype or pedigree, then they may be treated um, as that, one of those higher risk patients. So this would be patients with Lynch syndrome with um, familial adenomatous polyposis. And then familial colorectal cancer are those that have a family history of colorectal cancer. And really with the family history of colorectal cancer, we feel that that risk is really in the first degree relatives. And if there is a young first degree relative or multiple first degree relatives, then they should probably be screened with a higher risk strategy than what we're using in the colon, than, than what's available to average risk individuals in the colon screening program, namely that biennial fit. Individuals with a personal history of colorectal cancer, perhaps individuals with a personal history of a neoplastic polyp. There are trials underway in Europe and have been a lot of um, observational cohort studies looking at individuals, large groups of individuals who have had, you know, one or two low risk tubular adenomas removed and that they probably can revert to average risk screening with the general population, that that, the, that history doesn't seem to increase their risk of colorectal cancer long-term. That would be opposed to someone who may have numerous um, low risk polyps in the colon or someone with a higher risk polyp, so a large polyp or a polyp with more worrisome histology. Acromegaly increases your risk of colorectal cancer. Cystic fibrosis increases your risk of colorectal cancer. And there's recently been uh, published guidelines um, from the cystic uh, expert consensus guidelines looking at um, colonoscopy screening in individuals with cystic fibrosis and beginning at a younger age. Um, individuals with long-standing ulcerative or Crohn's colitis are at higher risk, and those who've had childhood abdominal radiation are at higher risk. And all of those need to be sort of um, looked at in a more individualized fashion. Um, everyone else can go into what we would consider average risk screening. Now, understanding that that average risk screening encompasses a spectrum of risk. So just like, you know, I as a woman at 50 is at much lower risk than a man at, you know, 65 or 70, there's that spectrum of risk just, to, you know, just with age and gender. There's also included in that spectrum of risk would be individuals who have comorbid diseases that may, you know, increase their risk of colorectal cancer or lifestyle factors that may increase their risk of colorectal cancer. All of those are, you know, encompassed um, in that spectrum of risk. And we don't feel that we need to alter that, um, that general population screening strategy to account for that. We do, there are um, uh, been several publications looking at these risk assessment tools. So rather than lumping people into average risk or higher than average risk, taking someone's individual risk, you know, their BMI, their alcohol intake, their family history, and sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, generating an age at which they should start screening or a risk portfolio. So I think like, you know, a lot of personalized medicine, you know, that is coming and particularly perhaps in younger individuals, which we're going to talk a little bit about early onset colorectal cancer, uh, which is, um, you know, you know, has become, a, you know, quite a timely discussion. So traditionally, we started um, colorectal cancer screening at age 50, and that's because the, the curve of, of incidence of colorectal cancer, as shown here, this is United um, States data, 
from um, the CDC. And in the y-axis is the um, number of individuals, the rate per 100,000 people. And along the bottom is um, age in uh, five-year gaps. And the curve really starts to sort of hit that exponential mark at around 50, but in that 45 to 49 year old range, it, it certainly is starting to, to increase. And, um, and all of the, the studies that we have available looking at um, uh, uh, you know, assessing screening strategies, these randomized trials all, all started at age, um, age 50 and some even later into, into the 60s. Um, this 45 to 49 year old age group um, up until recently um, hadn't been included in uh, screening guidelines with the exception of those of African-American descent in the United States that uh, some of the guidelines had recommended beginning at 45 because their incidence curves seem to be shifted a little bit to the left where it started to go up at a younger age. However, um, as you may have seen both in the medical and the, the, the lay um, uh, media publications, there is, has been a rise of both colon and rectal cancer in younger adults. And this was um, initially reported in the United States, but has been seen um, throughout um, Canada, um, Europe a little less so, and Australia. And interestingly, these cancers seem to be preferentially more distal cancer. So in the rectum or this, you know, the sigmoid colon, these individuals were often symptomatic at the time of diagnosis. So with rectal bleeding or changing their bowel habits, tend to be at more of an advanced stage. And as a result of this, both the American Cancer Society and the US Task Force of Preventative Health have recommended lowering that screening age to 45 years. Um, to my knowledge, these are the only um, guidelines that have made that recommendation. And this was not done um, based on any evidence. So the US Task Force says they do, they did it quite a big evidence review um, that I think Kaiser Permanente did for them that sort of accompanied this recommendation around uh, changing the age to begin screening. And they did a modeling with this, but they didn't include costs. So they just looked at number of colonoscopies, but it wasn't a cost effectiveness analysis. And they felt that it would be effective to start screening at 45 years of age and, you know, in the context of there being, you know, no to very low quality evidence supporting this because screening strategies haven't been studied in this younger age group. So the incidence rates um, had been quite dramatic. So when you look at, um, this is again, um, US data. So from uh, the SEER registry published in JNCI, um, showing here the different age groups by decade. And when you look at the, the relative changes in the um, incidence rates, you know, if you say, well, the rate of colon cancer has gone up 125%, you know, in people in their 20s, like that's quite frightening. But, you know, as with all clinical research, looking at the absolute differences, you know, is of course important. And so you, you can see that um, here, that would, that would amount to one person per 100,000. And that obviously goes up as you um, increase the, the decade of age that you're looking at. But in that 40 to 49 year old um, age range, it's, um, you, know, uh, you know, four people per 100,000 in, in this study. So um, a couple of years ago, um, Yuri Ladebaum, who does a lot of cost-effectiveness analyses in gastroenterology, did a cost-effectiveness analyses using um, uh, US dollars and looked at screening starting at 45 years and compared it to the, the current screening at 50 years. And he, he, their group looked at a variety of different screening tests and intervals and scenarios. And they looked at comparing those same resources that were used um, that increase in resources used to screen the 45 to 50 year olds and, and rather um, moving those resources to those unscreened individuals who are 50 to 75 years of age. And they found that, you know, the incremental cost, and this was, um, this was using um, uh, colonoscopy as a screening test, so not the fit. The incremental cost was $10.4 billion um, to avoid um, 29,000 colon cancer diagnoses and 11,000 colon cancer deaths. They, by using those resources, they could improve the screening rates in the, that current um, eligible age range, the 50 to 75 year olds to 80%, you go, they got a lot more impact for dollars spent. So they could um, avert three times the number of colon cancer deaths at a third the cost of what would be needed in that younger age group 
just because although the incidence is rising, the absolute numbers of colon cancer are, are still low. So you have to screen that many more people to have an impact. So it is an alarming trend. We don't know why it's happening. Um, they, you know, the, the thought is, is that it's happening too quickly to be due to genetic changes within the population alone. And there has been some research looking at um, whether there's, um, you know, lifestyle aspects, you know, more uh, sedentary population, whether it's related to diet, um, various other things it's probably not going to be cost effective to screen all the young adults and, and keeping in mind that these screening strategies have not been validated in this population. And I think it's very important. I think clinical research will play a huge role here in looking at whether we can, within this younger age range, these younger adults target um, you know, higher risk individuals that we, that we can screen if we, we can see some signals as to, as to who might be at risk of developing colon cancer at an earlier age. And, and I think, you know, in terms of physicians, you know, my, my takeaway from this is, you know, I think when, when patients, younger patients present with rectal bleeding or change in their bowel habits, you know, having this sort of context in the back of our minds, perhaps a lower threshold for, for referring them on to have a colonoscopy and for, you know, diagnostic testing. We don't, we don't, you know, need the business. I'm not trying to drum it up, but I think, you know, I think it, in my mind, it does, it, it makes me more prone to, to taking a look and just making sure that, um, that, that this isn't a patient who's developed an early onset colon cancer. All right, and then when to stop. So, you know, interestingly, the guidelines, you know, focus a lot on when to start, but it's really hard to pin down these expert consensus guidelines on when you actually stop screening. And within the colorectal cancer screening programs, they, I think they all end at 75 years of age. But, you know, of course, you know, it's, you know, that, that group of individuals after 75, there's such a huge spectrum in how, how fit and well they are and what their expected life expectancy is. So it's, you know, it's um, feasible that there are some individuals that um, it would be very appropriate to, to continue screening and, and surveillance colonoscopies on. There hasn't been any um, good Canadian studies on this topic, but there's been a couple of um, studies from the United States. So this is certainly the largest. It was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine a few years ago. And it was um, a prospective observational study looking at 1.3 million Medicare patients um, between the ages of 70 and 79 that they had followed for eight years. And they looked at, uh, they divided their group into two to two subgroups, the 70 to 74 year olds and the 70 to 79 year olds. And then they compared those who had a colonoscopy versus those that didn't have a colonoscopy, what their eight year risk of developing colon cancer was, and also looked at post colonoscopy adverse events, so up to 30 days after the colonoscopy. And they found that individuals who had had a colonoscopy, they did have a, a benefit in terms of the incidence of colon cancer, um, but that the adverse event rate um, you know, outweighed some of that benefit. And their conclusion was that while there was some modest benefit in 70 to 74 year olds um, in preventing colorectal cancer, that certainly in that 75 to 79 year old age group, um, that adverse event rate was increasing and, and that um, benefit to harm um, balance was, um, you know, tilting in the direction of harm. Now, these weren't um, controlled for uh, comorbidity. So obviously there could be um, you know, mitigating factors in this large cohort. Um, but I thought that was, you know, sort of an interesting trial, and certainly a very large number of patients. So again, there have been some modeling studies um, looking at this, and they found that in individuals who had uh, screened fairly regularly from 50 to 75, that continuing screening beyond 75 um, resulted in a loss of quality adjusted life years. Uh, due mainly to colonoscopy complications. And we do know that the risk of having a complication with colonoscopy does increase as you get into the 75 plus, 80 plus age range. And, and in addition to the risk of complications increasing, um, one's ability to recover from a complication is, um, is lessened. However, a separate group is those that have never screened. So if you have a uh, patient who is 78 and they've never had any screening, then it was worthwhile doing a one-off screening test on them. And they looked at a variety of different screening strategies um, and looked at um, different, uh, they had a scale 
think the Charleston index, they looked at different degrees of comorbidity in their model. And interestingly, they found that with a fit test, even with severe comorbidity, that they were screening these individuals up to 80 years of age. Um, obviously, this is a conversation that um, one needs to have with them. Um, with their patient to see if you know this is something that you know is in line with their their preferences for their healthcare, and recognizing that um, anytime you send a patient for a fecal mimic chemical test, that they they need to be prepared to do the follow up colonoscopy. So I would just say in conclusion of this that I you know I do think that it's appropriate to stop screening and surveillance at seventy five years of age. Um, in except in an individual who is unscreened, in which case you could consider a one-time screening test above that age. So in terms of um, tests, we've talked a little bit about the FIT, which is what we're using in the colon screening program in British Columbia. Um, there's been observational data showing a reduction in CRC mortality and inc incidence, but as of yet, no randomized studies. The interval is every two years. Some jurisdictions like the United States use one year, but we use two years in Canada. The sensitivity to, of the test does depend on the threshold for positivity. And follow-up colonoscopy is essential for abnormal results. And there's been studies showing when they examine failures in the screening process, that a patient with a positive fit who fails to follow up, have their follow-up colonoscopy is you know, over seven times a higher likelihood of dying from colorectal cancer than someone who um, you know, meets all of their screening targets. So there was a large um, systematic review and meta-analyses published um, in 2019 in the annals, and they had over 120 percent 20,000 um, participants from 31 studies looking at quantitative fit, so where you um, are able to set the threshold for positivity. And I just showed you here two of the thresholds they looked at. So this is 10 micrograms per gram, which is the threshold that we're using here in BC. 20 micrograms per gram is what the manufacturers recommend a manufacturer's cutoff is. And this is what's being used in most of the provinces and territories. Alberta is at 15, so they're in between. And this is um, looking at a one-off test with a follow-up colonoscopy. So this isn't sort of achieving that benefit of having fit every two years. So obviously the fit test is not meant to be sort of a one-off test, but even with that, the sensitivity for colorectal cancer was over 90%, specificity 90%, and AA, sorry for the abbreviation, stands for advanced adenoma. So those are those higher risk follow-ups that we feel are uh, more likely to go into colon cancer, sensitivity of 40% for those. And then as expected, as you um, go up, in, um, sorry, didn't mean to do that. As you um, increase your threshold, your sensitivity decreases, your specificity increases. So the FIT DNA is not readily available in Canada. Cologuard is a approved test in, um, in the United States and some patients do get it in Canada. You can order it online and send it in. So it um, is combines a FIT with a, the, that higher cutoff of 20, um, micrograms per gram with a multi-array DNA analysis of the stool looking for mutations in a, a number of different um, uh, genes, um, including APC and KRAS, as well as many others. And they looked at um, nearly 10,000 individuals um, where they randomized them to the FIT DNA test versus FIT alone and then had colonoscopy. And you can see here that the sensitivity for FIT alone was less than that for the FIT DNA. And interestingly, that 74% is very similar to what we saw in the meta-analysis that was done by the same author, Dr. Imperiali. And they, there was about a 20% improvement in sensitivity attributed to the multi-target DNA component of the test. So 92%, but just looking back, our, our FIT sensitivity, when we lowered the cutoff is the same as the FIT DNA. And you know your fit is you know about ten dollars, and the fit DNA I think goes between three and five hundred dollars. So, you know you you only have to do it every three years according to the guideline manufacturers in the U.S. Multi, uh, the U.S. Preventative Task Force. But you know it's it's a no brainer in my mind that in terms of cost effectiveness that the the fit test um, at a lower threshold will will give us the same results. So I just want to touch on flexible sigmoidoscopy because there was um, some, some great trials that came out, four randomized controlled trials with um, up to 17 years of follow-up um, looking at um, 
you know, invited to flexible sigmoidoscopy versus not invited, so a true control arm, and done in the United States and several sites in Europe. And the um, the authors um, of all of these studies found that there was an, a decrease in both CRC incidence and mortality. An intention to treat analysis on this um, on this systematic review shows a 22% decrease in CRC incidence and a 28% decrease in CRC mortality. And this benefit extended beyond 10 years. And that's why the interval for flexible sigmoidoscopy changed from five years out to 10 years. So colonoscopy, although it's a widely accepted screening test for colorectal cancer, has never been studied in a randomized controlled trial. There is one underway right now in four countries in Northern Europe. Um, there are, however, several uh, observational cohort and case control studies looking at colonoscopy and with the outcome of colon cancer mortality or incidence with quite a wide range, but up to 90% decrease in colon cancer mortality and 90% decrease in colon cancer incidence, which is incredibly impressive. But as we know, historically, once you have the randomized trials, we do find that these observational studies will often overestimate um, the benefit. The interval for colonoscopy is 10 years. So after normal colonoscopy, good for 10 years. CT colonography, despite having come out with the initial studies in the mid-1990s, never really published after that, to my knowledge, looking at these big outcomes of colon cancer incidence and mortality. They based the um, efficacy of the test on performance characteristics around a one-time CT colonography followed up by colonoscopy as the gold standard. And they had similar detection to larger polyps and uh, colon cancer. Obviously, the smaller polyps, flat polyps like the sessile serrated lesions um, were not detected on CT colonography as well. And for that reason, the interval is um, shorter than that for um, colonoscopy of five years. So just some other screening tests that we expect to see things, um, you know, some nice studies coming out over the next few years, capsule colonoscopy. You know, we have capsule available to evaluate the small bowel. Capsule colonoscopy is coming. It's actually being FDA approved, but really only for patients who have an incomplete colonoscopy um, or refuse other tests. Similarly, there's a serum test, a plasma methylated DNA encoding for septin-9, uh, with which if elevated has been shown to um, be indicative of colorectal neoplasia. Again, the FDA has approved this in the United States for patients who've declined other recommended screening tests. And to my knowledge, these are not available um, in Canada. Um, but I think, you know, certainly around a plasma test is very interesting because there's a lot of patients who don't want to do the fit because it's, you know, a stool test and having a blood test would be, would be fantastic. But the test performance characteristics, sensitivity and specificity just aren't, aren't really there yet. And then lastly, these volatile organic compounds that um, you've probably seen the cute dogs on the news that can smell people with cancer. So this is my, my nephew dog, it's my brother's golden lab, Chico. So he's here, he hasn't been trained to smell this though. Um, but there are dogs that can be trained to smell these vol volatile organic compounds that we release in our stool, breath and urine. And uh, so I also think that would be a very interesting thing to see study more. All right, so in terms of um, different strategies for screening, the highest quality evidence is for flexible sigmoidoscopy, and there's good evidence for both fit and colonoscopy, but we don't have any um, evidence of mortality or incidence reduction in CTC or fit DNA, although we can expect that would be the case based on modeling studies. And you know whether it's reasonable to use test performance alone, whether that's enough, Certainly there are jurisdictions in the United States that are happy to do that and recommend tests for colon screening. But I think in Canada, you know, certainly the um, Canadian Task Force on Preventative Health felt that we really need that higher tier of evidence, those randomized controlled trials before recommending a test for our patients. And especially when you're inviting a, an entire population to screen. So there's three randomized trials underway comparing fit to colonoscopy. Um, the colon prep study in Spain is finished randomization in 2017, pardon me, in 2011, and we hope that we'll have data later this year, which is very exciting for those in the screening world. And they looked at colonoscopy versus biennial fit. You may have seen, this is a while back now, they published their first round of screening in the New England Journal. So they have over 50,000 patients 
randomized. And they found that, um, as all other studies have found, that fit participation was significantly higher. Um, colon cancer detection was the same, but advanced adenoma detection was higher in colonoscopy. So what will be interesting is whether over the next four rounds of FIT screening that these patients will have, whether they are going to detect more cancers than the colonoscopy prevented by removing these advanced adenomas. And um, I think they're going to be quite similar, but I'm you know, really keen to see the results. So take home points, colon cancer incidence is climbing in individuals under 50. We don't, haven't made any changes in our screening recommendations yet, but are certainly keeping an eye on this. Um, screening and surveillance should stop at 75 years of age, but certainly consider one-time screening if the patient is previously unscreened. FIT is good. It has superior participation. It has a high sensitivity and specificity at the cutoff we're using BC. And we know that keeping up to date with screening will decrease colon cancer mortality. So I just have a couple of slides on the BC colon screening program that I'm going to turn over to Neil. So as I mentioned, we are using a biennial quantitative fit, but we, and I think this is unique to our program, we do offer colonoscopy to higher risk individuals who have a personal history of precancerous polyps, if they have a younger first degree relative diagnosed with colon cancer or two or more first degree relatives diagnosed with colon cancer, we offer them colonoscopy, organize it every five years. Ineligible, um, we feel that patients with hereditary syndromes, those with a personal history of colorectal cancer, IBD, really need that specialized follow-up. And if someone's symptomatic, they actually need to have a proper assessment and you know, a colonoscopy irrespective of what their FIT test is. And I think what I'm really proud of in the program is we have a great quality assurance initiative that underpins the program, which I'm going to um, sh just show you a few points on. So we're doing nearly 300,000 FITs per year that generate over 30,000 colonoscopies. Our participation is at nearly 40% of the eligible population. Now, obviously there is a more patients who are being screened outside the program. Um, and we do have, are getting access to the MSP data so we can have a better sense of who in the population is up to date. About every year we diagnose about 500 col um, colorectal cancers and about 50% of the colonoscopies um, that we do on these positive fits, we will identify at least one precancerous polyp. So in terms of quality assurance, we have quality assurance embedded in the FIT performance, the colonoscopy performance, which I'm going to discuss a bit, with the primary care phys physicians auditing their referral practices, whether there's, they're ordering the FIT too early, whether they're referring you know, inappropriate patients straight for colonoscopy, the pathologists, both around um, difficult diagnoses, and also the uh, synoptic reporting, whether all of the factors and reporting are there. And then we're also um, reaching out to our participants and trying to determine areas of improvement based on satisfaction surveys. So as I've spoken about before, colonoscopy quality assurance is very important to, to us. We know that the colonoscopist technique and effort that's put into the colonoscopy has really um, large impacts on their patients. So there's been very good studies showing that patients of physicians who have a lower adenoma detection rate, so they find fewer polyps on colonoscopy, those patients have a significantly higher chance of developing and dying from colorectal cancer. In addition, there's a wide range in terms of patient comfort scores, patient satisfaction, how physicians report out quality indicators in their colonoscopy report and how well they adhere to surveillance guidelines so they're not doing colonoscopies too soon or too infrequently. So our colonoscopy quality assurance is based on uh, four different things, a colonoscopist report card, direct observation of procedural skills, unplanned re event review, and post-colonoscopy colorectal cancers. That last is something that we are in the process of doing, so I don't have any data on. So here's an example. This is a, a theoretical colonoscopist report card. So we report out um, quality indicators um, in an aggregate fashion publicly, but individual colonoscopists will receive this privately. So we put down their adenoma detection rate and we, sorry, my pointer is not working here, but we adjust it um, for case mix. And we just started doing this. And you can see here on this line, this is um, done by individual colonoscopists in the program. This is sort of how widely the ADR ranges. And this is the adenoma detection rate. So this is a percentage of colonoscopies that had an 
an adenoma detected. So we have here the unadjusted ADR. And then after adjusting the ADR adenoma detection rate for patient gender, age, and fit value, you can see it dropped here. And we're using a benchmark of the adenoma detection rate for BC as a whole. And if the upper limit of the 95% confidence interval falls below this, then we consider that not meeting standards. And as you can see at the bottom of this quality report, we have standardized language recommending that that colonoscopist pursue some colonoscopy-based CME. And this is um, given out annually. So direct observation of procedural skills is where we have trained colonoscopists go in and observe another colonoscopist doing two colonoscopies and they fill out a standardized formative report and give feedback um, to that colonoscopist. So that sort of um, peer um, performance review and trying to give constructive feedback to enhance performance. Those DOP scores are reviewed at our quality management committee. And again, we send out letters, either congratulatory letters to colonoscopists who are meeting standards or to those who aren't meeting standards, suggestions for colonoscopy-based CME. So we have just, completed our unplanned um, event review to the end of 2017, um, looking at 14 days following colonoscopy, any patients who died were hospitalized or had a significant intervention, doing a chart review and then classifying them as being probably, possibly, or unlikely related to the colonoscopy. Again, we'll be reporting aggregate data out to the public and then individual colonoscopist data on their report card. And so for the first um, three years of the program, um, just under 100,000 fit positive colonoscopies done. And we noted um, a serious adverse event rate of 44 per 10,000 with the number needed to harm of 225. Perforation bleeding and death rates here, the death rate I'll just um, point out is a different denominator. It's per 100,000, not per 10,000. And this is well in keeping with um, other published reports from screening programs for FOBT positive or fit positive colonoscopies. And within the guidelines of less than a one in 1,000 rate of perforation and less than a one in 100 rate of bleeding. So we feel like, although there's always room to improve and through case review, we've made recommendations out to colonoscopists about considerations for changes in practice. We, we feel comfortable that we're well within that range despite removing you know, polyps on more than half of patients that are scoped within the program. Great, so thank you very much. And I, I think I'm um, just gonna look in the chat box here to see if there's any questions and I'll turn it over to Dr. Shahidi. Sorry, thanks Jen. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had to unmute myself. I'm still not very tech savvy. Um, so yeah, my name's Neil. Um, I trained here, but uh, I'm one of the new gastroenterologists at St. Paul's. Um, and sort of an extension or something that's quite synergistic or integral to colorectal cancer screening and cancer prevention is management of large colorectal polyps. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today because that's sort of one of my clinical interests. I don't have any disclosures. Um, you know, Jen's already covered a lot of this. Colorectal cancer is important and it's gonna become an in, even more important issue, um, you know, as we sort of reach 2030. Um, but large polyps are important. Um, and the big reason why they're important is that they have a, a much higher increased risk of cancer in comparison to sort of the standard polyps we take off during colonoscopy. The vast majority of polyps we remove are diminutive and the risk of cancer is, you know, I don't know if Jen covered this or not, but maybe like 0.03%. But as polyps get bigger in size, and normally what we define as a large polyp is greater than 20 millimeters, their risk is approximately 8%. And that was shown in the ACE cohort, which is the Australian multi-center prospective cohort. And that was actually part of the reasons why I went and trained in Australia. Most importantly though, or else I probably wouldn't exist, is that the vast majority of these polyps um, don't have cancer. Uh, and so maybe there are better ways of managing them than how they've historically been managed. And so speaking to that, um, you know, historically large polyps would go to surgery, but the problem is, is that, you know, even in the current era, um, you know, there's almost a one in a hundred chance that the patient may die, um, uh, even from a benign polyp surgery. 
And so, you know, with that in mind, maybe we can look towards less invasive or minimally invasive ways that we can manage these things. So this is endoscopic mucosal resection. Um, and so this is a large polyp in the rectum. You know, we start off by, you know, having a very detailed evaluation and optical analysis to sort of predict whether or not we think it has cancer. We inject fluid or like a colloid solution with a little bit of dye in it uh, into the submucosa, which is just the layer underneath uh, the, the surface layer, the mucosal layer. And then we take our snare and we just sort of grass tissue with our snare. And, you know, traditionally we use electrocautery to sort of cut through the tissue. And we just do this in a sequential manner, re-injecting periodically as the polyp comes off. Um, I won't belabor you too much with the video. I'll see if I can speed this up here because it sort of just sequentially goes through. This is, was done by my colleague during my fellowship and he sort of spots a little bit of residual tissue at the margin, so he cuts that off as well. And then, you know, let's see here. So ultimately this is sort of the end product this is him just inserting a little bit of dye into the defect to make sure he hasn't damaged the muscle. And this is a burning technique that he's using um, to try to prevent recurrence. Because polyps, you know, historically, have, you know, had about a 15% chance of coming back, even though we think we've got it all during the original procedure. So that's the, the end result of a, a classical endoscopic resection. So, you know, now with updated guidelines, really things have changed. Um, and the vast majority of polyps, these are both European and North American guidelines, the vast majority of polyps should be removed by endoscopic resection. Um, and Americans have now gone as far to say that EMR should be the primary way that we remove large polyps. I just like this side because I like bugging my mentor about it. So this is my mentor, Michael Burke. He's done a lot of research with respect to like, how to manage large polyps polyps and stuff like that. Um, he's very prideful about being Australian, but I like to remind him that it's actually his mentor is a Canadian. Uh, so this is Norman Marcon, he's one of like the godfathers of Canadian endoscopy and just recently retired and actually got the Order of Canada. And so, you know, through these two and a number of other important individuals in the literature, they've really highlighted that, you know, EMR is safer than surgery uh, and EMR is less costly than surgery. So, you know, in part, how did we get to this? Like, how did we how do we now say that you know, endoscopic resection should be the way in which we manage these types of polyps? And you know, one big thing was sort of showing, not only can we sort of manage the sort of straightforward, maybe two centimeter polyp that's sort of wide out in the open and it's pretty straightforward to tackle, but maybe we can show that you know, some of these high risk locations that I'll sort of go through or complex locations um, can also be managed by endoscopic resection. So this is at the anal rectal junction. And so you can see here sort of as a standard, when we do a colonoscopy, we do a little U-turn and we look back at the you know, uh, anal verge. And so you can see the polyp here, sort of sequentially going through it. You know, we resect it, we burn the edge, and then this is the resection defect going all the way down to the margin. Um, and what I recently showed, and this got published in Cut, which was nice, um, is that you know, endoscopic resection at the anal verge can be done. Uh, success of removing all the tissue was 98%. Um, uh, recurrence rates were sort of equivocal in, car in regards to rectal polyps, which is sort of this sort of tried and true easy polyp to remove from a resection standpoint. But most importantly, when we burn the margins, uh, we were able to negate the risk of recurrence, um, which was a really pivotal finding, specifically in regards to the management of complex lesions. You know, we're just about to publish this. Uh, and then, so these are lesions at the ileal sequel valve. Um, and so you can see here, this is the ileal sequel valve complex. And what we're starting to appreciate is that these lesions are all sort of not the same. So, you know, you have this lesion that's sort of, you know, out wide in the open, it's pretty easy to resect. I did this one and this maybe took me 20 minutes. And then these were done by some of my colleagues back in Australia. You can see this is the ileal, this is the ileum right here and the polyps extending in there. This is as probably as complicated as an endoscopic resection gets. And what we've recently shown is that, um, you know, they're still not equivocal. You know, we can't get, performance estimates um, uh, to be equal to that of other polyps not at the ileal sequel valve, but success rates of getting rid of all the tissue is still in the 90% range. And then when we start looking at sort of trends over time, we're now looking at success rates in the 94% range. Um, and recurrence rates, again, you know, historically 15 to 20% are now down to 5%. We have data, I don't want to belabor you on this, um, uh, but you know, we have data for peripetaceal polyps, we have data for circumferential polyps. Um, so, you know, I think it's fair to say that, you know, 
location is not really a limiting factor, which we still sort of get as endoscopists <laughs> to say, oh, you know, this person should go for surgery. Uh, funny enough, Jen just sent me a, a referral about a patient who was felt to not be amenable to endoscopic resection because it was at the ileocecal valve. And literally just before this procedure, I just did a fully circumferential ileocecal valve lesion. Um, so the next thing was, you know, can we, can we mitigate adverse outcomes? Um, the big one being recurrence. And so, you know, this is a polyp at the sigmoid colon. So ultimately I did this case, I removed it. If you're curious, this is actually a diverticulum and we've sort of burned along the margin carefully. And this is sort of the final result, the polyp's gone. Um, and this was a landmark trial out of where I trained Westmead. And what we found was in a randomized control trial that if you burn the margins, so, you know, you resect all that polyp just like this, but then you take your snare and you burn along the edge, that really negates the risk of recurrence. And so in the trial, it went down from 21 to 5%. Um, and more importantly, we have a validation cohort that's just about to be published. Um, and what we've now found is that even in the randomized control trial, there's a learning curve. We've sort of gotten better at this. And now recurrence rates are around 1.3% in regards to lesions that have sort of that complete burning along the edge. <coughs> Next is, and you know, Every, everyone says that perforation is the most feared complication. And I, I think it's specifically delayed perforation. And that's because, you know, as endoscopists, it's, our hands are sort of tied if they have a delayed perforation. And I would argue that the reason why people have, you know, delayed perforation, so, you know, you, you think you've done a good job, patient leaves the endoscopy unit, and then they start getting severe abdominal pain, you do a CT scan, and they've got free air in their abdomen, is that probably, we've actually probably damaged the muscle in the procedure, we just didn't see it. Um, and so this is something called the Sydney DMI classification or deep mural injury or muscle injury classification. And all it did is that it sort of walked us through to say, okay, well, this is sort of what a, 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 a defect or what a, a resection site should look like after the procedure. And then it sort of increased in severity. So you can sort of see these little strands. These are muscle fibers. This is uh, you know, sort of this whitish area. This is sort of dense fibrosis in that sort of second layer of submucosa. And, you know, I'd be hard pressed to tell you if I've damaged the muscle here. In this one, I've clearly damaged the muscle. You can sort of see I've clipped the muscle fibers. And this is the specimen on the reverse side of it. And I can see I've resected muscle. And then lastly, this is a frank perforation. And so, you know, this, this you know, classification system has been developed. We've developed risk factors like, you know, you know, if you're trying to resect a polyp that may have a cancer in it, or if you try to be aggressive and take the polyp off in one piece, um, or if specifically if it's located in the transfer skull, and so which is sort of just underneath the rib cage there, um, these are risks for perforating patients. Now, it's all well and good that you understand what the risk factors for a perforation is, but you need to be able to manage uh, the perforation if it happens. And so this is again, a, you know, Paul, I think this was a, just sort of the high rectum here. Um, and again, you know, sort of inconspicuous resection. And then you see here, and you see the sort of white cautery ring. And then as we sort of insufflate, you can see there's a clear perforation. So we just clip it up. Um, and so here's a video of a, of a endoscopic management of a perforation. So this is in the cecum. Um, and this is sort of a sort of very, very flat, inconspicuous polyp. Uh, why is it not running? Oh, there we go. Um, and so funny enough, this was done by my boss. Um, and, you know, he grabs some tissue. I can tell you, just take my word for it, that's sort of a standard piece that you would grab. And then right there and there, you can see that there's muscle fibers, but I bet a lot of people are probably not seeing that because it's quite subtle. And so right there is actually the perforation, that white cautery ring, it just hasn't expanded yet. So you can sort of see through the clip here, there's a little defect right underneath it. So this is a through the scope clip that we can just put through our camera. We grasp the submucosal tissue, he did something very aggressive here. And as you can tell, he's actually resected along the perforation, which I think, you know, uh, if you don't have advanced training in this, you're not gonna feel comfortable doing that. Um, and then this is the final product. So he's just sort of evaluating it, make sure that he's got a good clip closure. And this person was sent home the same day. And this is the final, final verdict. And so what we recently showed, and this got published in Clin Gastro Hep, um, is that out of 101, which is about 3% of patients that undergo these large resections have deep injury. So either, you know, you damage the muscle, you perforate through the muscle, or you perforate through the muscle and the bowel gets contaminated, uh, that in about 97% of cases, we can effectively close the defect. And importantly, 
there's not downstream effect. Now, there wasn't a difference in being able to complete the resection. I think, you know, recurrence is always going to be difficult because, you know, how many patients can you really gather that had a perforation and have been evaluated for recurrence? Um, so maybe the study was underpowered really to detect that. But importantly, we show that it's very effective. And so the next big uh, thing to address um, with respect to post-procedural complications, I actually just admitted my first patient for a post-procedural bleed, um, is that, um, you know, after we do these resections, sometimes as we're using electric cautery, maybe we don't really fully coagulate the blood vessels. So you can see here sort of in this defect that there's these little blood vessels. It's already been shown that we can't really just singe them or, or prophylactically burn them. That's not effective. And so maybe, you know, you, I sort of leave this defect alone, but maybe one of these blood vessels is not fully treated and it opens up after I've done my resection. So the patient comes in with post-procedural bleeding. And so this is showing um, a defect closer. So, so you using those same mechanical clips that I use to control perforations and closing the defect to try to prevent bleeding. And so in 2019, uh, there was four randomized control trials um, and one is not included here. And what they found was, is there was on, on a meta-analysis was a relative risk reduction of 0.37 or a relative risk ratio of 0.37. So clip closure, specifically of proximal large polyps, so proximal really being sort of the proximal transverse colon or the middle of the colon and moving towards the cecum, um, clip closure is effective. So previously attempted polyps, this is another sort of classical, oh, you know, I, this is not amenable to endoscopic resection. And so we've just published this uh, in American Journal of Gastroenterology showing that no, these lesions can be managed by endoscopy. So here is, you know, sort of a very prominent, you know, sort of flat grant, well, uh, we'll I'll get into the optics, but a sort of flat benign looking lesion. And you can sort of see here in the middle, um, sort of where this sort of white area is. So someone's really, you know, for lack of a better word, really hacked at this polyp, but really hasn't made a dent. Um, you know, ultimately we were referred to surgery, but sometimes we get referred to these polyps luckily because this is something that we can manage. And so we're just sequentially sort of working around the scar. We're trying to isolate the scar because the management of that scarred area is a little bit different. And so again, sort of just that classical endoscopic resection or EMR technique. And then this is something called cast where we actually pluck away that sort of scarred tissue because it's not really amenable to sort of capture with the snare. You can't really grasp that tissue up. And so then all the polyp tissue is gone. And then we actually use that sort of burning technique that we use at the margin and we singe that area, okay? And because now all you're seeing is sort of that fibrotic area, what we now do is we prophylactically clip that area to prevent a delayed perforation. And then we do the whole burn in the margin again. And there you have it, the polyps all gone. And so this is sort of, as you can see, this is the muscle lining of the vessel. So, um, you know, as mentioned, we've recently shown that uh, there really isn't a difference in regards to managing previously attempted polyps to naive or benign polyps. There's no, well, technically there was a statistically significant difference, but I would argue that there's not a clinically significant difference. And then when we took in the uh, ability uh, as a sub-analysis to say, well, if we bring those patients back for a second attempt, there is no difference and there's no difference in recurrence. And you can see that here. But again, sort of reproducing this similar to those lesions at the anorectal junction, we once again show that, you know, when you use that, that cast or plucking technique with burning. And then specifically when you do margin thermal ablation, um, you eradicate recurrence. So lastly are new techniques. Um, so one is cold snare. So this is quite revolutionary because, you know, as I've mentioned, a lot of the adverse events are probably from using thermal energy to cut through tissue because that's what's sort of partially coagulating vessels and allowing for bleeding to happen after the procedure. That's what's happening when you damage the muscle. And so cold snare resection is just a, sort of a really sharp thin wired snare and allows us to sort of superficially cut the superficial layer of the tissue off without really damaging the bowel. And so this is cold snare resection of sort of a 20 millimeter adeno or sort of adenoma or sort of benign regular polyp. So we inject underneath. My, one of my colleagues was very good at making videos. I'm not very good at making videos. 
but he has all these animations in these videos. But what he's trying to say is, you know, you don't sort of start at the, the center of it. You work at the margin uh, for anyone that's interested in Colt's near recession in the, in the audience. Um, and you slowly work away. And as you can see here, you know, you're not sort of seeing a sort of thermal energy being applied. It's sort of just slicing or cutting through the tissue, but you're still seeing that sort of blue or sort of stained submucosa. And so again, just sort of sequentially working on it. And then this next bit is just specifically to highlight that uh, right after this, that because it's such a safe technique, you're really not worried about widening your margins. You know, if you think there's anything less, you just widen it. Uh, there's no deleterious effects to sort of just widen your margin, making sure that you've got all the polypoid tissue. And then that's the final verdict. The polyp's gone. It's extremely effective. It's extremely efficient. It's quite quick and quite safe. And so what we recently showed when we compared this type of polyp called sessile serrated polyps, which are, are very amenable uh, to cold snare resection, this was also published in gut, um, is that you know technical success is almost 100, well, it is 100%. It's, it's very straightforward to use. Um, and there really wasn't any risk. Now, bear in mind, uh, this is at an expert center for endoscopic resection. Ultimately, there have been some very low incidences of post-procedural bleeding. And I think there's been one case report of a perforation from cold snare resection for a large polyp. The next kit on the block is something called endoscopic submucosal dissection. I know we're sort of running out of time here for, for uh, uh, chatting, so I'll try to speed up here. Um, but what this is, is that, you know, in lesions that you think maybe have an early cancer, so this is a large rectal polyp. Um, and as you can see here, sort of this is sort of gyroform, sort of, you know, I guess that's probably the best way of putting it. But you can see here in the center that this pattern is disturbed. And this is a sort of a feature of a cancer or an early cancer that we maybe can cure endoscopically. And so what we do is, is instead of using a snare, because if we take that cancer off in pieces, um, our pathologist can't say we've cured it. Uh, they're just gonna tell you that you have multiple pieces that have cancer, I can't assess the margins, and ultimately these people would go for surgery. But instead we can use this technique called ESD, where we use this electrosurgical knife, and instead of resecting on the surface, we actually sort of almost tunnel underneath the polyp, and we're sort of, sort of cutting right above the muscle. So you're seeing the muscle layer there, right underneath the knife. And this is the submucosa, that sort of blue surface. You see a large blood vessel here uh, that we coagulate. And then ultimately we sort of just sequentially work through this. And this is the final product. Okay, and this provides a chance for cure. And so, you know, if, if lesions sort of all have all these low risk features, which I won't get into, but if it has all these sort of favorable features, we can cure cancer endoscopically, which is really important, specifically as we get lower down, closer to the anus, and we try to prevent things like abdominal perineal resections. So this is just a slide saying, you know, we've now gotten comparable to um, Asian endoscopies because that's where ESD was derived. And so again, just sort of speeding through this, you know, hopefully I've highlighted, and this is some plus analysis showing that no one technique can be applied, that we have to come to a, a realization that all these modalities are important. Um, and the way in which we sort of figure that out is something called optical evaluation. And so we try to characterize sort of the surface of the polyps because the shapes matter. It dictates what the risk of cancer is, okay? We also try to look at the surface because the, the surface smoothness matters with respect to the risk of cancer. We also look at sort of the pattern of the polyp because this is an adenomatous pattern and this is a serrated pattern. So now we resect these with that cold snare technique that I highlighted, this would be resected by that knife technique or the snare technique. Predicting cancer is a little bit of a different beast. There are optical classifications for this, um, but the sort of universal feature is trying to detect these sort of changes in the surface like I showed you in that video. You know, we go from this benign surface this sort of changed surface and that's the cancer. Whereas this is uniform throughout and this is a benign polyp. So we've recently just shown that in flat polyps, you can predict this quite well, predict cancers, and that allows you to really stratify. Whereas for bumpy or nodular polyps, we're not as good. Um, and this was sort of a landmark figure slash study showing that you know we've now sort of identified specifically polyps are lower down and maybe have nodules or bumpy and sort of have that smooth surface these are sort of those candidates that are very good for that knife or on-block resection technique.
And so this is just about to come out in gastroenterology, which is sort of sort of the, the pioneer GI journal. And we've now really delineated how we should be managing these polyps. So if you think it's sort of one of those low risk polyps that you pull snare, you pull snare. If you don't think it's a cancer, you remove it by endoscopic resection techniques or that EMR technique with the snare. And then if you think it's high risk for cancer, um, you ultimately send it for a multidisciplinary team review and you commonly will move, manage these patients either by ESD or surgery. And so hopefully in summary, what I've shown is, is that now large polyps are an endoscopic disease process. It's no longer a surgical process. And it's quite rare now that we send patients for surgery. It's only if we really think there's a cancer that I can't cure endoscopically that I send patients to surgery. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I know we're just about out of time. We have one minute. There's a, in the chat box uh, from Dr. Mathani. A uh, question for both of you. In relation to colon cancer prevention, what do you feel the role of vitamin D and coffee are? Uh, I guess that's the question. Yeah, so I think, you know, with respect to vitamin D, there has been a lot of um, studies showing benefits of vitamin D for a variety of different cancers in some epidemiologic uh, cohort studies. Um, so, you know, in terms of... Uh, you know, what I, advice that I give to my patients, I think that, you know, taking vitamin D has a lot of health benefits. Um, I think that the, the dose of vitamin D to take, I don't think has been um, totally worked out. Some of the studies looked at very high doses, like 5,000 international units a day. Whereas, you know, you know, I'm not sure if that's, um, being established as being completely safe and you know in terms of um the coffee i think that that needs probably needs more research before we you know uh, recommend people start drinking coffee to um to uh establish that although i, I believe it's been shown in women to decrease your chance of death and i guess you know i try to thank you so. yeah Thank you. I'm, I, I'm sorry, we are out of time. Uh, thank you both. Uh, before I thank you officially, just to remind people in the next two weeks, because of spring break, we won't have grand rounds. Uh, upon coming back on the third week, uh, the Division of, uh, uh, of Addictions Medicine will be presenting grand rounds. So uh, a really great, great, great presentation from both of you. Uh, uh, two very different components of your um, of your specialty. I'm um, I'm in awe of um, Jennifer's um, uh, information, and I love the quality uh, assurance things that you're doing uh, as part of that. And Neil, I have no idea. I think if I did one of those, that'd be it for my whole life. I'd go home, <laughs> read a book. Uh, so come thank down you. to the unit. We can do it together. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, Barry. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks, everybody.